Spirits of French Lick is proud to introduce the Maddie Gladden Bottled and Bond Bourbon. This four-year-aged bourbon is double pot distilled and non-chill filtered and has a full-bodied mouthfeel with eucalyptus, molasses, clove, ginger, and slight citrus as well as grains of paradise. The finish is long and reappearing on the back of the tongue with notes of pepper, tobacco leaf, and mint cream. All of our spirits are available for tasting and purchase inside the French Lick Winery and Distillery. Spirits of French Lick, respect the grain, please enjoy responsibly, and be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. <laughs> That's not the right song. <laughs> That's perfect. You're gonna find, can you, yeah, I see it. I'll give you like 30 seconds and then we can talk in another. No, you gotta find the right one. You had it up there. I actually I had, saw it. I knew it. <laughs> that was amazing. Perfect. That was right. By this much. All that anticipation. Oh my but that's God. why that's why the podcast is so awesome. We fuck up and we don't yeah. correct it. Exactly. <laughs> we get this better is, and better. This is pre drinking too. That was. Oh my God. What about that door song? Yeah, just play that one. This one right there. Right there. There we go. There we go. There we yeah. go. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! All the setup for a mess up. to an awesome edition of the Scotchy Bourbon Boy podcast. This week, we are really in a different place, a real different place. We are at the Spirits of French Lick Winery and Distillery. We are here with Master Distiller, Alan Bishop. <laughs> sure, <laughs> Bish, sure. <laughs> Master Bullshitter. And one more time. Laurel and Doty. Yes, and then also Super Nash, and we have Roxy, uh, on the camera on camera and everything like that and uh you could check this one out on youtube when it hits in a couple of weeks there's gonna be a lot of editing we got different camera angles this time <laughs> no, 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 we're not we're not we're editing out the, the content it's look just gonna UFO be ufo you guys, you guys, guys where you're supposed to look <laughs> well you got that one there that's an on you got that one and you got that one this one will move all the time so and then if they have any questions, we can answer them uh, on Facebook Live. They'll, we'll just answer them, answer them direct. Cinematic shocker with all those cameras. <laughs> <laughs> we got a little light to blind you for the stuff that you can't you see. Add that in with the 5G and we're all going to have uh, massive heart attacks. Right yes. There. yes. I don't need any help with that. I mean, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Me neither. I had that yesterday. Yeah, I regretted that all day long after that, too. That was, that was a bad time. That was dumb. I knew it was dumb when I did it. <laughs> did it anyways. Smothered cheese stuffed noodles. A lot of cheese going on. Well, they're cheese. They're, they're getting ready to cut it off, so you got to get it all in it. Right? Right? right. Apparently, I got the last one. I don't know if they were like counting That's down true. their servings or what, but apparently, I got the last one, and people were disappointed. Yeah. <laughs> you weren't. I least. wasn't disappointed at all. about it though. Any of that extra cheese sauce? Just go ahead and bring me a gallon of that. Yeah. <laughs> Sick. Okay. What's what's really cool is I we played the Maddie Gladden ad at first and I was sitting right next to you while I was listening to you. It's not <laughs> super weird. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I apologize. <laughs> and I don't have to do any. Uh, I usually do a read, and I don't have to do that here because we're here. We're here. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And we are in the Rick House. Yeah. The barrel, barrel chai. Room. Yeah. Barrel chai. And it smells unfrickin' believable or unfucking believable. No, I'm, yeah. I'm in the real mode. <laughs> right. We have to thank Christopher Lopez for telling me that the lens was fuzzy on your camera. Oh, so, so you just, wiped down the Yeah, nose. so there's a big yes. wipeage that just happened. <laughs> and now he says it's perfect. Absolutely. Right? <laughs> I'm about to report that one of them oh, I was getting no. ready to say, hey, something's on your face <laughs> <laughs> there. <laughs> Dirty equipment. 
So now, then we were talking a little bit before and I wanted to get right into it. You do the, ex exactly, I forgot what it's called already because I suck at that memory thing, but the mash. <laughs> Mash in, mash in, yeah, 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 yes. yeah. yeah I, I dress up all dorky and, and period clothes, and uh, you know, it's a good thing that I'm not single because I'd never get laid. <laughs> <laughs> when you when you dress up like that, though, you have the look. You would have oh, gotten yeah. laid in the 1800s. Oh yeah, they've been all about it. They've been all about it. They've been like, look at those pants that go up to his chest. They're amazing. <laughs> They're amazing. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. That's what they thought was hot back then, though, right? right? They were into it. Yeah. <laughs> No, the bad thing is, uh, uh, me and Brian Cushing at Locust Grove have gone out of our way, like, with the clothes that I wear, like, even for the time period that we're in, they were out of date, because I told him, I was like, I'm playing the poor Hoosier who came across the river to come, you know, to come help the rich man make whiskey, so I want to look like I'm a little out of, uh, out of the time period, like, even back then, they've been looking at me, they've been like, Man, the same shit my dad was. Four years ago, you know? <laughs> and you gotta, and you gotta ha actually have what the preconceived notions of the time period. Oh yeah, were. you gotta cover you gotta that. Get into yeah. character, and then there's a whole thing like. Uh, uh, so one of the things I found out the hard way, which of course I'm bald anyways, but you shave your head back then, that was a, a sign that you were a convict or a felon. So <laughs> yeah. go right into that with the tattoo number. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, that's the teardrop. You gotta get the teardrop. I always find it funny that when I was growing up as a kid, they always told you, well, if you do that, you're gonna end up in jail and they're gonna feed you bread and water. And it's like that somehow that was a bad thing. That, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? It's Not, better than if you fix Hamburger Helper one more time this week, Mom. Yeah, <laughs> no. exactly. and, and for me, it's not like now if I eat bread, it's like I gained like five pounds and so I can never have it. So all I ever want to do is eat bread. So I was like, maybe I can get in jail and just eat bread. <laughs> my, uh, my, my body's going through this thing right now where, so my wife, her gallbladder is, is going bad. She's got to have it removed, right? So she's changed her diet the past week or so, which means that I have mostly changed my diet except for here because there was pizza and pasta. Uh, <laughs> but like last week, my biochemistry was all messed up. And then like this week it's even worse because I've now eaten pizza and pasta here two days plus all the healthy shit that Kim's been cooking. So my body's like, the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> I, 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 Go to work yeah, to cheat on your diet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> plus the amount of tasting that you must do. Uh, yeah, <laughs> especially with all these barrel picks with single barrels and stuff. It did uh, that and then the podcasts and all that stuff. It. Uh, it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. No, I, I basically have been doing since uh, I believe in late October, I've been on an elliptical. And so I, that that's that's how I've been able to go negative for a little bit of where I would have just gone completely positive in the other way. Well, and that's that's when it really gets to Since you. like three Octobers ago, I've been becoming an elliptical. <laughs> <laughs> so, I've been sort of living through Jeff. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you got to keep that that going. But um, the mash ins. I mean, those are those are cool events, and yeah. you do such a good job of promoting them on Facebook. It's just kind of like every time you're there, I think oh, I need to drive down for one of these and just be a part of it. Yeah, man. I I love doing those. Those are like uh, I don't know. There's something about going back and doing things the old way. Um, it's almost a spiritual sort of thing, whether it's at Locust Grove or doing, you know, the Hell's Half Acre stuff, whatever. Um, there's something to be said for doing things that way and having to break down your laziness with modern equipment and actually go back and, you know, split the wood and get the fires up and going and mash in with a rake and do the whole thing. Like, I'm more jealous of Steve Bayshore uh, at Mount Vernon than I am of anyone else in the industry because I think that he has, and obviously he doesn't get to mash in all the time and run the stills all the time. But overall, I think he has the coolest job in the entire distilling industry, and I would love to do something like that for a living. Um, but yeah, I enjoy that. And you get to teach people stuff. They get to see a way that whiskey and brandy was made in a way that they're entirely unfamiliar with. Uh, you know, they, they, people just don't realize what went into this industry early on. And I think particularly with Locust Grove, man, that place, anybody who's in the bourbon should go to Locust Grove when we're mashing in. Like if you want, if you're in town for three days and you have time to go to visit three places, if you were to come to Louisville and hit Locust Grove, which hits that pre-bourbon era, right? So frontier whiskey, 
and then you went downtown and hit Copper and King, so you got the brandy thing. And then you went down and you hit either uh, Old Forester or um, uh, Elijah Craig, not Elijah Craig, Evan Williams. Evan Williams, yeah. You would have an overall nice little overview of kind of the majority of the history of distilled spirits in Kentucky. So uh, it's just getting the word out there about it and making it become a more consistent, more regular thing. And, you know, we play around with whiskeys, we play around with brandies there. We just got done uh, working on an absinthe project and all that stuff, so. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, like you said, it, it, to do it, and then you have the respect of what kind of work went into it yeah. back then. And then also, it, when you when people are doing uh, <laughs> distilleries, yeah, there we go. Oh, damn, I thought you quieted that thing. <laughs> <laughs> and you even said you did. Oh, yeah, you had to play I the music. The there you go. Um, <laughs> when you, like, even now when you go to distillers and, and, the, and craft distilleries, like what you're doing, you see the work that people are putting in. Oh, yeah. And it's just like... Like it's 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 beyond a job, you know. It's, oh, yeah. there's And and coming from the art field, I totally understand. It's like when you're putting that type stuff into you, you're putting your soul into it. You're trying to make it the best for people because you're sharing that, and they all know that you do it. Right. So there's a there's an aspect of uh, when something's down, how much more you're going to try and go in and fix something, or something's not going, how much more you're going to do because you know. That and this is it's your name and you're yeah. passionate about it and it's going to get out there yeah i mean you know you're not going to you're not going to get into the craft distilling industry and uh stay in it very long if you're not absolutely in love not necessarily with the drinking aspect of it but the production aspect of doing those things and what goes into it and how can you manipulate things to get different flavors and tastes and you know and for me i have to i have to be able to do like all of that stuff uh, short of making my own malt because you know Caleb and those guys are way better at that than I'll ever be. And I don't want, I just don't want to do it. Um, Understandable. <laughs> but yeast and, you know, even like I started building little um, six and 12 gallon stills for some local museums. And uh, I don't have any mechanical skills. I am, I am absolutely just mechanically stupid, truthfully. And uh, I'm there with you. <laughs> spent, spent way too much money on tools and copper at this point to not finish that project because my wife will slip my throat with a paper envelope in my sleep. So, uh, but you know, there's something to that and being able to build even just a simple functioning, you know, cochine or moonshine style still, you know, now I've always had respect for the copper workers, but even more now, you right? Know, because I know yeah. it goes into a very basic thing. So, well, and then also the, the love of it is keeping you going too, because you started it, you wanted to do it. It's like, it's kind of like you're back in the old days, if you would have done this and they would have kept working on it day in and day out till they got it right. Till they figured it out. They would exactly. just get, you know. It. <laughs> and sometimes less is more and that's the fun of it. Dude, that's part of the fun of Locust Grove, right? Is real simple equipment. Uh, you don't have a lot of options. You're also limiting yourself with what did they have available to them at that time that they could actually use to make whiskey out of. You know, and very rarely was it, you know, oh, our mash bills, you know, 60%, whatever, 13% this. It was, uh, what do we got? Let's throw it all in there. See what happens, <laughs> you know? What can you make out of it? So, well, and then I'm excited for you in, in the, now that you've been doing this, how many years have you been at the Spirit of Friendship? Uh, let's see. We were actually, this is our five year anniversary this month of distilling. So I've been here about, five and a half years now but but just awesome. as a distiller in the same place for five and a half years and then working with the barrels and everything in your and then what you did initially is really starting to come out now yeah but what you're putting laying down now is how much you've learned oh yeah further and then that what's going in there and you're getting you know with the apple brandy you can get that out pretty quick but then also with the whiskeys, it's just going to be so exciting going forward. It is. It's, it is. It's, that's the great thing about the industry. And, right? ha and having having stuff now that's been in barrel five years, you know, we, we went the exact opposite of everybody else. Everybody else released a rye whiskey at two years old. We released two weeded whiskeys at, you know, two years old. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have a five-year bottled blonde rye this year. That, to me, is super exciting. You know, or even getting into, you know, we, we sold out almost overnight with that whole Fred Minnick thing on the uh, Lee Sinclair bottled and bond. So now we're on the batch two of that Lee Sinclair and seeing the differences between batch one and batch two, having a larger number of barrels to choose from and dump from and being able to create uh, basically the same blend and flavor that you enjoyed before, but there's a little more complexity here and a little more heft and a little more oomph to it because we had 
more experience. We were no longer new on the equipment. You know, we're, we're figuring out what we're doing and how we should be doing it. And uh, just having a lot more of it in general to choose from. Mm -hmm. Does it make it a little bit easier to, I mean, now that you run the equipment and know what to expect or is Not it on my just liver. <laughs> no. No, no, it says no. <laughs> it, you know, if I'm dumping 30 barrels, you know, I've, I've got to taste all 30 of those barrels and then I've got to go through and I've got to grade them uh, into, a, into a system, you know, because there are, there are compounds, right? So you have basically these four flavor profiles that go into a Lee Sinclair blend. I have to go through and identify all four of those. And then there's the fifth, sixth, and seventh, which are, uh, what the fuck is that? And where did it come from? <laughs> so, you know, it might take me three days to taste through 30 barrels. Because once you get to barrel 10, you're, you're done for the day. There's no way you're tasting anything yeah. after barrel number 10. It's yeah. not happening. I, I had trouble with uh, three barrels trying to, at my first, but, but one thing I did learn, and I'm sure you, you do, is you have to eat. Uh, yeah. Well, if you don't eat, it's, obviously. <laughs> well, no, but, but if you don't eat, it's all it's all, and you're doing ten. It's all over, and you don't even. You might pick a barrel. <laughs> so you don't even remember. Right. Well, I'll tell you, uh, the Mississippi guys. There, there, um, there's something in the water in Mississippi, uh, and I'm pretty sure it's that the water is just liquor, because when those guys come up to pick barrels, they don't play around. They're like they'll want to go through like 24, 25 barrels, and I'll tell you two things I figured out both times you're up here is a is it lunch yet? Because please God, let it be lunch. <laughs> and B, I've never tapped out of a barrel tasting, but they had me there. Like both times, I just want to be like, all right, guys, um, whatever you got, what you got, because I'm going home one way or the other. Wow. I love you guys, but I'm going home. <laughs> I'm making dad drive because I can't right now. <laughs> and that's Some one thing nice guys having your like big burly guys. guys and well, actually, some of them, like, yeah. no. it's the little ones yeah, that are that's scary. Right. The little ones are the ones that are scary. <laughs> that's they put that's what I thought you were going to say when I, when I mentioned that. I had to convince them to take a break for lunch. I was like, wait, we'll, we'll taste through some down here and then break for lunch and then we can go to the break. Well, my, um, my son in law is the same way. He's this little guy and he can just unbelievably drink an unbelievable amount of whiskey and you're just like what how <laughs> christy atkinson no, 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 from the silver's talk is like that she uh she can out drink me and she can do it for she can do it for several days on end like you know four days and, and they'll be and she'll be hanging out with people and drinking and she doesn't always drink a lot obviously but like if i hang out with somebody for a day and i drink the next day i'm worthless i'm just done <laughs> I, if I eat and stick to one spirit, you I, I, I can stay on that and, and then the next day everybody's in all hungover and I'm, I'm fine, I'm good. Right. But it has to be one spirit. As mm -hmm. soon as it changes, then it becomes it's all over. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you said that about Christy because uh, she said something about next time I come up, she'd take me around to a few yeah. distilleries yeah. soon. Yeah. I, I need to watch out for that. You, uh, you, I would, I'll tell you right now, you bring snacks and bring an <laughs> oxygen tank. <laughs> and uh, uh, just bear in mind that she seems sweet and innocent, but she's evil on the inside. She's, uh, we call her Welsh Christy. She's a swamp witch. Uh -oh. so. <laughs> Okay, so anyways, uh, with that said, what do you have here for us? Yeah, so we pulled out a couple of different things that, uh, I, one of which you've had before, but so the first one that I pulled out for you was the uh, the new blend of the Lee Sinclair Bottled and Bond. So this was like a 27 barrel dump versus uh, batch one, which was I think 14 or 15 barrels, something of that nature. Um, so obviously it's gonna be you know, the same Sinclair that you know, but again, there's some more complexity here. I feel like this batch is actually better than batch number one, um, just because we had more selection that we could get into. And this hasn't uh, hasn't come out in the gift shop yet because there's still tax stripping it, I believe. So. Yes. The fun of tax stripping. Although we did just ship some um, to JBI, so it will actually cool. be hitting stores in Indiana. In Indiana. Yeah, the, uh, we were out of our bottle and bond Lee Sinclair for, uh, help, I don't know, like two months, something like yeah, that. Yeah, good, a good um, two, three months. And it was overnight. I mean, as soon as Minnick, as soon as Minnick hit this, it was, you know, pedal to the floor and it was gone. Oh, uh, and, the, and the cool part of that, all that, uh, that I've noticed that with what you've been doing on social media and what other people, uh, 
And I actually used uh, at Christmas time. I, I made a batch of the Scotchy Bourbon balls yes. with with the Lee Sinclair uh, bottle de Bon, and that was delicious. Mm -hmm. I think we brought brought some of those for you. You did, I mean, yeah. Like you all cheers, cheers to everybody. Cheers. 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 So what's what all is involved in those? Uh, so, well, the cool. I initially got the recipe off of, or we got the recipe off of makersmark.com. You can go there, get the base recipe, but then you're talking about soaking pecans in bourbon. And they're like three to seven days. Then then make your, well, I, He goes all out. Yeah, and then, <laughs> and then when COVID hit in March, I actually let it go all the way to August because it, 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 nobody knew what the hell was going on. And I'm just like, I'm not making candies you know, for people it, until everything kind of got a grip. So when we finally did it, I mean, you're talking 16, 17 weeks in the, and it turned out so spectacular. Oh my goodness. Here comes one. <laughs> wow. Yeah, they're really good. And uh, it turned out so good that then I started increasing the, so usually it goes at least two months. I, I let them soak for eight, eight weeks. Wow. And okay. then make the batch. But, uh, and that's so, and then it's also uh, powdered sugar, butter, and then bourbon mixed with the, the crushed up pecans. And then you roll those. Mm -hmm. And then that becomes the filling. You let them sit and they, they and then you uh, put them in the refrigerator once they're rolled. In then you roll them in powdered sugar, and then once you're done with that, then you put them in the refrigerator. We usually do it overnight, and they're cold. And then you dip them in chocolate, oh white chocolate, gosh. and then that so really we experimented with the chocolate a lot. Every batch it gets better. We do mm -hmm. different things. How we've pretty much perfected the white chocolates now, and then we've been adding. You do you can put salt, you can put uh, more crushed pe uh, bourbon soaked pecans and whatever, but. Usually you just keep it consistent with the brand that you're making. Sure. So. Oh, I do want to warn you, once you take a bite, yeah. it'll ruin you from any other <laughs> bourbon malts that you have. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're that good. Yeah, they're yeah. not legal. Yeah. I, I, he no sent me a box of them and I... Uh, as good as those. I might have given dad one and hidden the rest of them. <laughs> <laughs> This is gonna get. This is the thing I'm talking wow. about. Wow! Get stuck in my braces. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. No better time than on a podcast. Mm, all right. right. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh man. Hey, at least this way she can't do a close up. Oh. Right. <laughs> that yeah. that the the finish is so so good on this one. The finish is insane. I feel like both vanilla. the mouthfeel, the yeah, the, the vanilla and that caramel, that caramel malt really pops. I feel really like the finish and the mouthfeel on this are better than the first one that we did. Um, I was really proud of that first one we did, but I think this is, there's more here. It's bigger. And it does have the Indiana profile. Oh yeah. It's there. That fresh bread, that grain, the commitment. It's funny the, how some, some people won't like the grain taste whatever and that's kind of what you're shooting for with this exactly. particular bird. The whole idea of respect the grain. Yep. And I, I also like the idea of, that you always stand behind the, of the mouthfeel. Yes. Being yeah. behind the mouthfeel. I'm of the huge on, on the, the mouthfeel of the whiskey. Yes. It, it doesn't matter how good the whiskey is if the mouthfeel's not there, it's worthless. It, in my opinion. Yeah. You know, it just um, this one is actually kind of one of the issues that I have with like cognac. I uh I've had cognacs that I really like, but a lot of times cognac comes off as too thin, mm -hmm. I think, and, mm -hmm. and people have our time with that if they like a lot of flavor, you know? That's that's me, I've always been big on, on the mouth bill, and that's where, because I, I have bad sinuses, so I can't get really get the aroma, so, so I really don't get the taste until I get it in the mouth yeah. bill and then on the finish. Right. right. So this is a question off topic, but absent. Mm -hmm. What's the mash bill for an absinthe? Is it whiskey with botanicals? So it just depends. Traditionally, it would have been like grape spirit uh, that would have been distilled to a high proof. Uh, so 170 basically would have been your proof. Um, well, at least by the belly you pop, that was common. Um, later on, you start getting into grain whiskeys as bases or neutral grain spirits, you know, 190 plus. Or, um, you know, there was even a tradition of rum based absinthe in the Caribbean. So the 1800s, when absinthe became so popular in France, right, late 1800s, mm -hmm. because of the blight 
on the wine because yeah, they look, yeah. so they basically were taking the shitty grapes and distilling them at a higher level than wine making because that yeah. was making that would get rid of the that would get rid of the bitterness and then so they were using the grapes but they were making absinthe to some extent and then once absinthe really started to catch on then it was whatever kind of industrial grade ethanol you could get hold of uh, so a good example would be like in the Swiss Alps. Um, I was sugar beets, Swiss. Okay. Sugar beets would have been the alcohol that they were working with. Okay. So then the botanicals was were the part where in the high alcohol content and the botanicals and then the wormwood adding in for the extra effect that yep. everybody, you know, I still haven't seen the green fairy yet. <laughs> right. Right. I painted her, but I haven't <laughs> seen her. Well, there's such a. Such a small amount, even in traditional, you know, pre ban absence of alpha, alpha thujone. I mean, you would, you would likely die of alcohol poisoning before you ever had a hallucination. But there are some pharmacological effects from some of the other botanicals that are in absinthe that can certainly, um, you know, licorice root. Uh, a lot of guys, you know, if they were going a little light on anise and fennel, they might use a licorice root extract and licorice root. Um, is actually a uh, vasodilator, so okay. you can get some effects out of that. Chamomile, of course, has some some effects uh, <laughs> yeah. as far as you know, making you a little sleepy. Or killing um, you. <laughs> yeah, anise and fennel both have psychotropic effects to some very small degree. Um, hyssop is the same way. So there's certainly something to that lucidity from drinking absinthe. I mean, and you know this, and and I know this from drinking. I mean, I get an entirely different feeling from drinking absinthe, a much more lucid drunk right. than I do if I'm gonna sit down and drink some Lee Sinclair. You know, if I'm gonna sit down and drink some Lee Sinclair, I'm trying to probably like work through something or shut something out for the day or whatever. If I'm drinking absinthe, like I've become the dumbest redneck hillbilly philosopher <laughs> that you've ever heard. Well, from a from an art standpoint, what I if I have two absinths, okay, so you know, the classic way with water and sugar and do the whole thing. I can paint and not lose my motor not, skills, yep. but as soon as I have a glass of wine or I add in a little whiskey, it then it's out. all over. <laughs> it's it's just out. gone. Yeah. It's like the yep. But I've always that, and then also you're able to see colors. It opens, yes. it dilates yeah. your pupils to just see reds, redder, that type of thing. And that's all. That's what I've always loved about absinthe as an artist. I've done a lot of painting, uh, it, and then also you get the the high or the drunken. Yes. That, that you get, but without the loss of control. So you're you're a little bit more able to make decisions uh, without worrying about them when you're painting. Cause you know, you're painting on a canvas and you've spent digitally $450 on it. Right. And you're like going, I don't want to screw up. I don't want to screw up. You fuck have a couple of, copper. you have a couple of absents and you're like, fuck this man. This, <laughs> this, this, let's see how that goes. Right. And you don't care and you still can do it. And yeah. usually the results are good. Well, you know, all interesting. All spirits are keys to, to doors of perception, basically, and they all have their own vibe and their own personality and their own feeling and their own thing. You're right. And absinthe is probably, in, in my mind, to some degree or another, the most useful of those particular keys. Creative. Yes. Yeah. If you want to, if you want to still be productive but have a good time, that would be interesting to you do know. a to be distilling with a couple of you know, and then see what you know you might go for it yeah <laughs> you know yeah i uh i i spent a couple years in louisville drinking absinthe off the still so i think I'm, yeah uh, you've I'm done it before okay. yeah, you, know, you only miss lunch so many times before you're like how's it five o'clock <laughs> why is everything closed in butcher town bullshit exactly where did the day go right yeah you can do that for a little while, but it catches up. Well, I think I think getting back to the whiskey, the bur especially bur the bourbon, you're talking a lot. Bur where so many people for so many years, it was a party kind of thing. Where now, it's more of a relaxing, yep. enjoying life. It allows you to sit just enjoy, yeah. forget about what the fuck happened during yeah. the day, yeah. and you just sit back and you have. Or to even work through it, you know. I mean, and you know, I've probably sent it to you before too. I, I mean, I'll drink sometimes, and I just start sending like YouTube links to my friends. Yeah. <laughs> you ever heard this song before? <laughs> I feel like I need to share it with you today. Yeah, it's always it's always a good day when I get a. Uh, uh, 
a messenger message from Alan. It's just like, it, it, one, it just makes me happy. <laughs> Next morning two, I wake up and I'm like, what did I say stupid on social media? I'm sure, I'm sure there's something I regret saying. But, but who cares? I mean, that's the whole thing. That's what's great about you. Who gives a shit what you yeah. say? Yes, you're gonna get some of this, but at the same time, I find sometimes when you get the negative aspect on social media, way more people pay attention. It all helps. It helps. You know, this industry is as much about who you piss off as it is who you make happy sometimes, in all honesty. Uh, if you're not making enemies to some extent in the spirits industry, especially if you're on the craft side of things, you're probably not doing it right. And not making progress. But, yes. but not enemies on purpose. Right. You never do. Yeah. You're just making that straight up because you're passionate about what you do and you're oh, going to yeah. stay true to what you do. And it's staying true. It, I, I mean, even on some of the big guys of the whatever, they're trying to stay true and marketing does not want... Doesn't they want to make the money. Yeah. And they know that they... You know, marketing knows that you can put out a cheap piece of shit and make money, opposed to waiting and putting on a quality thing, and it, it, it's a it's a trade off. But yeah. the long term for them doesn't matter. The long term, and when you when you're talking bourbon, one hundred percent long term is everything. You're gonna basically keep doing this, and then after you're gone, there's gonna be barrels just like. Uh, Parker Bean, mm -hmm. his stuff is still being produced still being afterwards, and that's that's a legacy, that's a, a lineage, you know, and passing it on to the next the next generation. And the one thing that's been so true that the more you get into this is that even during the bad times, everything keeps and sustains. It's kind of like yep. you know, even during prohibition, there was still stuff left, even okay. when it was over thirteen years later. They thought it was shit because it was aged too long, but then they realized at that point that aging can actually. Some, yeah. Well, and then you can drive even the opposite direction of that too, and on the illicit side of things. I mean, uh, you know, there's there's some great home distillers. Cause that's the <laughs> yes. fucking politically correct way to say it. You know, and they were during prohibition as well. So there's there's always good alcohol out there, and there's always. There's always good keys for whatever the journey is. You know, you can get drunk on your swing and go anywhere in the world as long as you got YouTube <laughs> <laughs> and a phone, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's amazing now, right? Yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah. we're we're doing this from the barrel room. Mm -hmm. I mean, that wasn't something you could do a while no. ago. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, you know, being a distiller too. I mean, it, even not that long ago in the early '90s, late '80s. You know, nobody nobody went out of their way to go talk to the distiller about anything. You know. Uh, not since back before Prohibition was at a thing, so we got snackage going on here now. Yeah, I just wanted to have a piece. I thought it's all right to me. Yes, it's old trade. This will be the first time I actually ate on a podcast. So. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Nothing wrong with that. But I, but getting back to the now after I took us off topic, the <laughs> the bottled and bond. Yes, I really and and having the Lee Sinclair and then the Lee Sinclair bottled and bond, and now having the second batch. The to be able to with you go through this is just it's it's an experience that I never imagined. Even three years ago, when I was just starting to get into this. I never thought that I'd be sitting here drinking with with uh, you, created the creator of the spirit. I'm sorry, say, please don't say the Alan Bishop. <laughs> <laughs> no, the bitch. <laughs> yeah, like just about as bad. Yeah, it's all good. Yeah, no, it's good times, and it's been fun for me to do this stuff too, and, and be able to put this in front of people. And I still have those moments of like, really glad I looked into this thing because I don't know what the hell else I'd be doing for a living if I wasn't distilling. Uh, I'm not. I'm not uh, overly talented at anything else, so this is kind of what I've got. But kind of this or Walmart reader, I think. <laughs> yeah, except, except Walmart. you're so talented at it, and you've done it, and the journey, and that's one thing why everybody always wonders, you know, how did you get to that point? You know, so many things happen, and then you just realize that almost like, it's like what you were born to do, and you got to do it. Right. Yeah. You get to wake up every morning and do it. But, awesome. but you can't just sit there and say you didn't do a lot of things to no, get to No, you have to keep working at it. Yeah. yeah. All the time. All the time. And even if, even if you're comfortable with your with your distilling methodology and the product that you're making, then you still got to push it out the door to people. Right? I mean, I we could, there's how, how many guys are out there right now making truly great products who you've never heard of because they don't understand the marketing side of it, and they don't do anything to push it, and they don't do... 
What's that? <laughs> oh my god. That's amazing. Why is it's there 11 53. Why is there an alarm going off at the <laughs> so it's, 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 it's at, Kung Fu at fighting. My, at my other job, it tells me it's lunchtime. Okay. <laughs> right? And if you're not like out the door, you need to be, right? Yeah, that usually, that's, that's usually, usually that's what it means. I need to get out of Go. here. <laughs> <laughs> that scared the shit out of me. Honestly. <laughs> I that. You guys ready for the Iconoclast? Yes, uh, I've been ready for this for a yeah. while. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, the same Mashville, so 60% corn, 17 wheat, 13 oats, 10% caramel malt. Uh, Mashville, I came up with when I was 15, I think we talked about that last time. Um, what the Iconoclast is, is, it's obviously the same the same label as the, the bottled bond, but with a little sticker on the bottom. This is a three barrel dump. And so what happened was, from the first couple batches of Sinclair that we had, there were three barrels that were decidedly unlike Lee Sinclair. But of their own accord, those three barrels didn't have any one element that like, if I tasted them and I was gonna do a single barrel, I wouldn't put these in front of people that wanted a single barrel. They just weren't where they needed to be at. So I got thinking, well, what the hell am I gonna do with them, right? So I started playing around with different blends, different proportions, and it turned out that when you blended the three of them together in equal proportions, they were far better than some of their parts, and in my opinion, superior to the Lee Sinclair, Sinclair bottled and bond. Um, it's a little, a little brighter, um, a lot of like honeysuckle and honey notes to it. Uh, out of everything I've ever done, this is my favorite thing I've put in the bottle so far, I think. So, wow, so although that William Dalton's pretty close. I was, uh, that's, that's one thing uh, I had, was talking to Freddie No at the barrel pick, mm -hmm. and he said the same thing. He, one thing that he learned is that you can have three blends of you know barrels that you're blending, and they could be not good or good, you know, whatever, and you blend them, and they as uh, added up it brings can produce to the table. yeah can produce something that wasn't even there yeah that's yeah. one thing that he said like when he works on Little Book. That he said that, that that he's learned yeah. that, that it's just like it comes out of nowhere. Well, you know? even even some of these guys that are doing merchant bourbon, where they're actually playing around with the MGP stuff uh, that was cons that was supposed to be component whiskeys, some of these guys are pulling out flavor profiles from those MGP mash bills that are mind boggling because they're yeah. used them the right way. Right, and and yeah, and and that's the skill of blending. And, and I, I hate to say this, but one of the better blenders. Where the blenders are, are they come from Canada? There's mm -hmm. just some unbelievable. It, yeah. Right, that's one thing. Whereas bourbon really is just starting to get into that blending aspect. It's so young here compared to the other whiskeys. Right. That there's just not a there wasn't a lot of people. But it's so cool to be a part of that. You yeah. Know, I mean, really, the finishes and the blends, which have been a part of Scotch forever. In the U.S., you basically, I mean, as far as consultants going, on, I'm sure I'm forgetting somebody here, but I mean, Nancy Fraley is really the only kind of professional blender that consults for distilleries that I know of off the top of my head. And, you know, she's, she's trained in cognac where that's a very common thing, mm -hmm. you know? And, but then she also has a very different approach to it than say somebody from Canada would have, or somebody would, from Scotland would have to that blending thing. Um, mine is all, I mean, I've done some classes and stuff, but mine is almost all self-taught as much as anything else. So. <laughs> And it's good that yourself because where you do your mixing and blending to, for profile and everything is yours, and you're really you're starting you're getting at the point where you understand you you understand it fully, right? Or you're, you're you know, and it's really cool that when you're using your own you know oh yeah our own stuff different places yeah we do get some honey and four of that so oh yeah. yeah nice ooh like a honey bread <laughs> just missing the butter. <laughs> That one is by far my Ooh. favorite thing I've ever put in the bottle. So Ralph Burgess says he loves that iconoclast. Yeah, he's a good guy too. <laughs> yes, he is. We, we, Ralph is. All, we're all kind of between yeah. Super Nash and yeah. myself. We're talking constantly. Yeah, that's for sure. Hey, Ralph. Yeah, that kind of. Yeah, it's so different. Yeah, Doesn't it sell? Doesn't we're just saying this is the one that's selling for like a thousand, twelve hundred <laughs> on secondary. <laughs> yeah. No, it's uh, it's going on the tertiary market for Dogecoin. For Dogecoin. Oh, hey, Dogecoin. my my son's into Dogecoin. He bought it at one cent, and he's like having a field day that it's sitting he's, at 40, 50 cents now. He, he's just took he's his. Probably sitting at three quarters of you know being able to get an iconoclast. Well, wow. no, what's really what's really cool, honestly, is that what. 
I, I can kick myself, but in 2010, when Bitcoin was just starting to hit, yeah, a guy offered me 10 Bitcoins for one of my paintings. And Bitcoin oh, was yeah, nothing. about that, I remember that. And it's just like, all of a sudden now, now. Just, that's $500,000. <laughs> and I'm like, damn. So when my, my son said, hey, do I have Dogecoin? I'm like, I'm in. <laughs> if you had those 10 Bitcoins, that would be two bottles of Iconic. <laughs> and I, and I, would, I would trade for that. That's that good. Right, right, exactly. We also, I mean, uh, I, I, one of my hashtags is we sell souls. So, I mean, if somebody wanted one, you know, we, 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 we take partial portions of soul. Well, I'll give you my whole soul if you let me work here. <laughs> I'll, I'll trade you half of Jeff's soul. <laughs> you traded my soul. <laughs> I made that deal when I started, and I'm just saying, think about it real hard. Oh, no, I. <laughs> Well, that's what I was trying to happen. <laughs> is. She's no. actually got it in a jar. Ooh, your soul. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Oh. Awesome. Got a nice, to, nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm really, really proud of that one. I think that's a good one. It's amazing. I see why. Absolutely. It's the sweetness. Yeah. It's very good. With the grain mm. compared to, you know, the you're, we're comparing the two, right? Yeah, well, you get the, the house characteristic of the bottled and bond is that kind of eucalyptus, um, a little of that menthol yeah. characteristic, yeah. a little anise versus this, which is that sweet caramel, honey, honeysuckle, uh, maybe a little ginger sort of uh, note in there as well. Um, I love both of them, but yeah, the Iconoclast is, uh, and we'll never be able to reproduce that, but we are going to do more Iconoclast series stuff, like anytime we have barrels that are off profile that aren't going to be single barrels of their own. If we can find a way to do blends with them, mm -hmm. we'll do them and release them here. Well, but I find that that's what whiskey lovers are liking now where, you know, when this first all started, it's like they wanted their Jim Beam to taste like Jim Beam every time. And those distillers of those days worked their ass off to keep a cons consistent taste profile. Yeah. But now that this boom has happened, and there's so many people, people love to be able to uh, get something different. Uh, there was a, an Oceans, and it was a Ohio State pick. And it tastes like French toast. Right. I mean, straight up, but that's it. It's never coming back. I savored that bottle. I actually saved it uh, for Super I Dash to have some. I saved it last night. <laughs> <laughs> Can you? What the <laughs> hell is going on yeah, there? I snap, know. snap. I'm trying. You got my attention now. <laughs> I'm trying to make it so everybody, everybody can hear Everybody's you guys. watching Facebook Live. Yeah, Facebook, Facebook Live. Facebook Live. Facebook Live. Facebook Live. Facebook Watch shit. Watch Jeff's YouTube video, which will be all edited and pretty. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know. Those the, were, I don't think they were, even <clears throat> three years ago, they were accepting this type of no. different, but now people are in it and they realize you taste something and you're just like, holy shit, how can yeah. it taste like that? Now, I do, I, I also found that the time you're having and when you're tasting, mm -hmm. a lot of times will affect, it will like, affect things. you go back and you're like, well, that didn't taste as good as it did when I was with mm -hmm. him or I was exactly. out uh, doing this. But at the same time, a real, you, you you can, uh, like for instance, it's always there, the, the good taste, and you just know, you know. And then, do you have days where your palate's off, where you just oh, yeah. stop? Yeah, that, or I get I get wore out on it, like I've, I've told Florida a few times, I've had to like walk away from stuff and come back to it later, because I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna try to do anything if something's not right, you know what I mean? Right. Um, and that could be palate based on either you don't feel good or, Palette based on you just have a shitty day or what? I mean, a lot of things can really upset. You. Again? Okay. <laughs> Stop it! Don't don't let it hit again. It's you're just resetting it every. It's twelve oh three. Ten minutes later, it's gonna come. Damn it! I have now not that time. I, I that am, time, I am not trained in AV. Alan, Alan, I, 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 I sharded that time. <laughs> <laughs> I have to. It happens to the best of us. Yeah. Just, oh, uh, you know, yeah, too much, uh, too much Italian food. You know, <laughs> That's, why you gotta the last That's right. <laughs> Emergent, yeah, yeah, extra pair of overalls. <laughs> well, that was spectacular. So thank you for that. Yeah, no problem. So this one is, this next one is actually one thing. Can I ask you? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I love the way that you come up with the names like Maddie Gladden and the stories behind the Believe mm -hmm. Sinclair. Uh, 
just it, it, the iconoclast. How to come up with the name <laughs> of that? Is, or is there so, a story behind it? Or sometimes I just you know or uh, just, great artists steal <laughs> and mediocre artists borrow. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> sort of twofold. So I had a friend that when I was moonshining. Home distilling, sorry. For yeah. uh, she she always told me that my stuff was, or that I was an iconoclast because I was thinking outside the lines, outside the normal stuff, whatever. And it just kind of stuck with me. But really, what happened was years ago because we're so influenced by music in particular, right? Mm -hmm. So MTV used to do a show called MTV Icons, and one of the best ones they ever did was uh, for the Cure. And so I was thinking that MTV Icons thing and that logo and how you could play off of that with a bourbon. To where there's a little music influence in there, and uh, and then it's also it's a good it's just a good story because people always go, what the hell does iconoclast mean? Where yeah. did that come from? So well, exactly, it got me to bring it up and yeah. think about it. Yeah. yeah. So you're a Cure fan? Oh hell yeah, I'm a Cure fan. So, yeah, 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 exactly. Love the Cure. I, I couldn't believe um, at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame uh, when they did their concert there how good. They didn't look good. No, but, no, yeah, no, no, they sounded. Yeah, good. you've you've seen the meme of Robert Smith, right? Where they're like, "Has anyone told told Robert Smith that he's melting?" <laughs> <laughs> it just it, it's like that look barely worked for him then. Yeah, and now it just it looks it just is so. He looks like wrong. someone's like grandma, slightly mentally deranged Italian grandma. Yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, I'm just like. Holy shit, that looks like my German grandma. He looks like a he's up there singing and wow, that sounds good. Right, <laughs> right. Talent. How does your voice sound like that, but you look the way you do? Yeah, God. exactly. It's just like, no. <laughs> right, right. Everybody knew back then it's like that was weird, but still kind of cool kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. The cool's gone. Yeah, you don't have to There's do it no, anymore. Yeah. You don't have to do the theatrics yeah. anymore. I think I would be impressed if I just saw just, you. Yeah. You can keep the weird hair, you can just go. Go ahead and ditch the makeup and you guys just play acoustic and we'll all be happy if you if you play four or five times a year yeah we'll still respect exactly. you and love you yes <laughs> so so this is the uh the william dalton we haven't even released the bottle and bond of this yet i think we've done a couple single barrels of dalton yeah. so this is uh the replacement for our the weeder what we call the weeder so it's the old uh, ath stitzel mash bill 70 corn 20 wheat 10 uh, malt we use caramel malt so this is a barrel from 2016 one of the last of 2016 william dalton barrels um it was four years old, and then I got a hold of some uh, toasted French oak staves from Steve Bean, who okay. brought them up here. He came up here and hung out one day, and I threw a few of them in the barrel and finished it on that French oak. And uh, this one, I, I, I'm not even gonna say, I'm gonna let you guys see what you think of it, but. <laughs> awesome. It's, That's right on the Maker's Mark uh, yep. thing, right? Yep, yep. Which, it's still bourbon. It doesn't have to be American oak. It can be any kind of oak. Yep. I, as I, long as it's one, new Yep, exactly. And toasting is just a lighter form of charring. Yes. That's, yeah. But toasting is, yeah, I, toasting. I mean, spectacular. I mean, honestly, do you like do you like toasting or? I do. Uh, so char, a lot of people get confused by this. So char itself in a barrel is really just there for a filtration element. Right. Um, that's why all the big guys go with threes and fours because they're running column stills. You can't get as clean of a cut off of a low rectification column still as you can a pot still or a coffee column in particular. So they need that three and four char as a filtration unit. What we need is a two char because we've already got clean cuts. Uh, what we want instead of that heavy char is we want a toast level underneath that char. So medium plus toast and then medium plus toast heads. That toast is actually what's going to give you your lignin breakdown, and that's gonna give you um, your toasted caramel, your vanilla, uh, toasted coconut, toasted hazelnut, those sort of things. Um, it's where all the wood sugar is actually at itself as opposed to, once once it's charred, it's, it's, it's really nothing but carbon. There's nothing there. Right, you lose it until you hit that <laughs> barrier. Once yep. the char, that's where, the, where with the char, you're picking it up, but you're also, like you said, you're, you're getting that filtration process, yep. so they'll char it a little heavier so that they can get the bad stuff out in, yep. into that level. And the same reason why they, you know, our warehouses are different than what you'll see in Kentucky. Uh, I, don't, I, don't need to, <clears throat> I don't need the heat to drive off volatility. In fact, in some cases with uh, Lisa Clair or anything that's a little more volatile like oats or buckwheat, I don't want those high temperatures because I'm driving off that volatility, I'm losing aroma. And if I lose the aroma of the grains that I'm working with and our motto is respect the grain or focus on those positive attributes of the grain uh, and the blend and balance of fermentation, distillation, and then maturation, 
I've defeated the entire purpose of everything I've done at that point. Right, your taste, you're, you're doing a specific taste profile and that type of high heat mm -hmm. uh, barrel aging is gonna eliminate most of it. It's designed to eliminate most of it. And that's what they're trying to do there, which is completely and totally fine. And it's made them a lot of, but at the same time, this is just proving that bourbon can taste, you're controlling it to taste the way you want it. And like, and I've, I've just, there's an Indiana taste profile, which Very is, much so. which earns respect. I mean, like you said in other podcasts a million times, that you're not trying to compete against the big boys. They yeah. do it good enough and there's yeah. enough of it. But and we're, we're not even trying to compete with, with even Hubers. You know, they have their yeah. own style and we have our own style. And what we're, what we're here to do is, is to represent the Black Forest of Southern Indiana in particular and all those distilleries that are gone. I will say this right now. It's the first time I've said this. This has now replaced this for me. I absolutely love first taste this. is just got I, I love weed and bourbon and that's what this is me right? too that's yeah. my number one go to me three uh, nice. I've heard you say this twice in this so far uh, you use caramel malt mm -hmm. is that not is that a like a brewer brewer's malt it is and I've heard, I think I heard you say that on some of your other podcasts before uh, yeah so yeah. Jerry this Jerry Distiller's malt is likely the least sexy thing at a distillery. Mm -hmm. It has one job, and its job is to convert starch into sugar for yeah. conversion by yeast into CO2 and ethanol. The distiller's malt doesn't have much flavor. There's just not a whole lot there. Um, and that's that's one thing where the industry has made a mistake, the big guys, in my opinion, too, is, is pulling their malt back, relying more on artificial enzymes, um, and not relying on that malt flavor. If you go back and you look at old Nashville's, they're not, you know, five percent malt. They're not ten percent malt. They're a lot of times fifteen percent malt and higher. Uh, and the reason they were doing that is they were trying to get the flavor out of the malt that they could. But these brewers' malts, in particular, so they don't have the diastatic power. They don't have the ability to convert starch into sugar that distillers' malts do. What they have is a ton of flavor, and there are a ton of different profiles. I mean, that's what makes craft beer so popular. There's so many options that you can play with. So, you know, if I want some caramel. I don't need to get the caramel out of the barrel. I throw in some distiller or some uh, caramel malt. How does that work? I mean, when you're talking about caramel, does that change it from not being bourbon? I mean, or chocolate malt or what? What what makes a caramel malt or a chocolate malt? I've never. So they're roasted to different degrees, basically. So like uh, caramel malt, you'll have um, 10, 20, 30. Uh, that's basically based on how how dark it's roasted to get that flavor profile out of it and the color out of it. Um, but they are still malts. They still fall as long as you fall into the normal bourbon, um, you know, parameters. You can use whatever malt you want to in it. Um, as a matter of fact, you can you can make a, uh, a bourbon with all one, you know, all all your proportion of malt. Get it to you. Oh, you should. You you wrecked it. You you. I wanted it to turn it off. It's gonna. Keep Put it back down. I'll turn it off in 12 minutes. 12 minutes? Poor Roxy. I couldn't find you. Can't it's all right. Clock. I, I love, hey, who doesn't love kung fu fighting? Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. 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 Well, kung fu adding, fighting adding. is good. I'm going to get banned on YouTube because I have kung okay, fu I'm, fighting. Okay, I'm timing it 12 minutes from now. 10 minutes. It'll be 10 minutes. Yeah. It'll be 12, uh, 12, 21. Yeah, whatever. Okay. Uh, just <laughs> hand it to me. Don't One stop One minute it. before. Okay. So you turn it the fuck off. So you can switch out all of your proportion of malt to brewer's malt and you're still you're still golden um and as a matter of fact brewer's malt was was much more common pre-prohibition than distiller's malt was distiller's malt wasn't really you get what's called six row distiller's malt um maybe in the 1850s 1860s coming out of tennessee etc but most distillers throughout the united states would have been using malt that was made by the local brewer and and roasted to some extent okay cool so it's the roasting that takes it so they call it because it gives it the flavor yeah it gives it the flavor yeah or like uh, chocolate malt for example is, is for all intents and purposes um, it's almost burnt that's where the characteristic comes from you get almost like those coffee those dark cocoa notes out of it and color yes yeah. I mean the mash bill for a chocolate malt when you're watching that mash, oh yeah it's just brown, blackish brown yeah. yeah well I mean you, you, like know, you, you look at like a, a dark stout <laughs> Going to see that coloration. This has actually got a darker color than the other three. It does, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, that French oak yeah. really came yes, through in it that. Does. 
I'm getting that French oak that had the, the finish is I'm getting dark chocolate finish like all day long. It's mm -hmm. it's spectacular. The finish is like whole oh, and it's long. Yeah. And it still has the, the your your profile, your specific yep. grain profile, but at the same time, there's so much sweetness and complexity. Mm -hmm. And you get that earthy note at the back too that I like from that French oak in particular. Right on that, the back. Yeah, yeah. That, that earthy right note sort of sort of gets in there with that uh, that kind of uh, menthol sort of characteristic we get from our house yeast, and uh, I I really enjoy that a lot. As a matter of fact, I've got more of those French oak staves. I'm gonna try to do some Sinclair like that as well at some point. Mm -hmm. so. That would be that'd be fantastic. Um, that is a perfect go to bed pour. That just like hits the back of your throat, the, kills all the stuff in the back of your throat. And it's like, and it's not too much. It's just like, you feel like it's, and then you get the hug. I'd like to point out just how professional I've been. Look how almost perfect those pours. That's so oh, weird. That's oh, something. Yeah. Yeah. No, no pour spout or anything. Well, you know, you can tell which one. Yes, it is. Except this one except is that down. One's little that one's up, and that one. It's kind of. It's kind of yeah, yeah. Of course, in there. you're just Put saving it. it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. So the the. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping you guys like that one. That one, like, that one was a lot of fun to play with. This is beyond it's, like good. It's fucking awesome. It's yeah, yeah. I really like yeah. that one. Now I have to, mm -hmm. you know, I have there's to step a, up. <laughs> there's a little toasted coconut in there that I pick up on here and yep. there too that I like a lot. Mm -hmm. Almost that that uh, like almond joy sort of thing going on. So. I would, yeah, yeah. Right. there you go. Almond joy, yeah. because you got the chocolate. Yeah. It's funny you should say that. I was just thinking in my mind that I love almond joys and it. I get that almond I get the, taste. I get the yeah. almond up front. Yeah, I get the yeah, almond up front. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then I get the coconut and then the, the chocolate. That's, awesome. Yeah, cool. that one's delicious. Wow. Yeah. And that, that so that one is named after William Dalton. So he was the, uh, that was the longest tenured distiller in Indiana history. Um, he worked at the Daisy Spring Mill Distillery uh, for 55 years under two different owners. And uh, you're only ever going to hear his name once or twice ever in Indiana history books. But he ran those pot stills for 55 years the hard way. There's the camera. I was looking for. I was like, "Where's the camera?" There it is. <laughs> 55 years the hard way, you know, running off of wood fires and that whole thing. So he deserved a little, a little respect. So. Until Absolutely. Now, yeah. Here more now. Right. right. Well, yeah, you're going to hear his name a lot more yeah, now than that. I, I, for sure. Yeah. Whether yeah. that gets out. Oh. And the bottled and bonded that'll be out. What, June first. June. Okay. June first. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So that's the single barrel. Yep. And then you'll have the bottle and the bond with that. Okay. Excellent. And there will be a single barrel label at the bottom of that one. They just haven't come from the printer yet. Did you say we we're making a trip back up to? <laughs> yes. A couple of people <laughs> right. said good looking label. They like. They yeah. all are. Yeah. yeah so I the, love your label. The single barrel will actually be on the tasting room in the next couple of weeks as soon as we get the the label in. Um, okay. And then the bottle and bond releases in June. Who does your design labels? I mean, if I can ask, I mean, yeah, do you yeah. all y'all so, have a part in that? Or we we work. Jolie Casper's Zach worked here, and uh, mm -hmm. she she it was a huge part of that big red, obviously. And she's hey, moved, Jolie. And hey, she's Jolie. moved on to other things now, <laughs> but she was a, a huge part of figuring out this this line mm -hmm. and this family of products in particular. Um, it was really a matter of working together with her and and the family, and then also uh, Sean White, who was our previous sales guy. Um, I don't have the greatest aesthetic in the world for making labels, so like <laughs> I have the ideas in my head, but I have to have somebody I can put that in front of. So okay. um, she was very easy to put that in front of, and then she'd get that design with uh, uh, Jeremiah. Jeremiah, yeah, yeah. Uh, would do the uh, illustration. Local artist in Jasper. Mm -hmm. well, okay, yeah. cool. And and the whole team aspect of it, of what you're talking, you know, they're executing what you perfectly. Well, the uh, like the paper like the linen that was that was sean white uh who by the way is um the whitest girl that i've ever met <laughs> i love him to death but it's true he's the whitest woman i ever met uh, <laughs> he can say that now he, he had this um obsession with like the texture of the paper and so we spent months with different paper samples trying to figure out <laughs> just exactly what that right to and it works so well I mean, no i mean yeah. honestly that's that's something that you might not consider if he wasn't here and the feel of the bottle is part of it there's oh, no yeah. doubt when you pick up a bottle and you you have that texture opposed to the smoothness or some people have the, the embossed on yep. the label or you know the actual 
yeah. and boss them with the class. Anything that sort of brings you in, you know what well, I mean? It's sort of antique is too. Yeah. Um, yes. Which brings back to like the history part. It does. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and the nice thing too with the illustrations is sometimes, sometimes there are no pictures of these people. Like, mm -hmm. there's a picture of William Dalton. One picture. That's it. Yeah, and that's it. With Sinclair, there's. There's some pictures of him when he's younger, and there's two or three pictures of him when he was over at the hotel. But there's really not a lot. We're not going to have to worry about that with you. Oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be, Just think in a hundred years, yeah. they're going to be pushing Shock. you on. Be like Basil Hayden, but with a shocker. <laughs> <laughs> or just, just you'll just be like, right, <laughs> eat it, eat it. I hope somebody just does a comic panel of it. You know what I mean? It doesn't have to be a photograph; it can be a comic panel. <laughs> but that's the great thing about it, like. Even the fact that you pulled him, he did something for 55 years, mm -hmm. and, and, and then you were able to pay respect to that, and that's what that's about how yeah. bourbon and whiskey work. It's like, it's forever. Right, well, you know, the, that, that's the thing with, with the whole bourbon thing, too, with the bourbon thing. People love bourbon barons. They love those, those stories of the guys who had the money and finance things, but you very rarely used to get the stories of the distillers, and so, as a good example, there's another product out on the market that is named after someone who was associated with that distillery um, for years and years and years, but he himself wasn't the distiller there, you know? And so right. Dalton needed that that, uh, that little bit of attention, in my opinion, and he deserved it, so. And same thing uh, today, even at the big distilleries, you have all the, and they seem to want to promote everyone. Right. You know, and that's one thing, and then, uh, I have a question on the George Washington distillery. Mm -hmm. Who was his distiller? So that was uh, uh, James Anderson was oh. the name of his distiller. He was a, a, a Scottish uh, uh, distiller originally, or we suspect he was distilling in Scotland. Steve Bayshore does. Um, and then he may have had a small distillery or done some distilling work over here in the U.S. as well. So there was him and then there were also... And Bayshore would have to clear this up, but you should get him on sometime. You, you love Steve. He's awesome. But there were also, I, I believe, five enslaved African Americans, maybe six, yeah. that were there as well under Anderson. Um, but yeah, I mean, Washington wouldn't do anything, but that he didn't hire somebody that. Here you go. Here's your chance. Here's your chance. Is. Okay. All right. It's <laughs> amazing. Stop. All right. Fuck that alarm. Fuck <laughs> that alarm. alarm. Washington would have never done anything, no but he didn't does. hire somebody that knew what they were doing. And so Anderson was actually a farm manager um, and he's the one that talked Washington into starting the distillery and said, hey, you're, you're losing money hand over fist on this farm or on these farms, there were five, I believe. Uh, you need to find some way to uh, to make money and I think I can make a distillery profitable, so. What, uh, the wow. HBO show, what was it, uh, Boardwalk Empire? Yes. And that really is what got me into yeah. the distilling aspect and understanding the history of what's going on. Because mm -hmm. they, they tried to stay a little bit towards, you know, the yeah. reality of the yeah. situation where, where roads to New York matter mm -hmm. and how they, how they, and then they realistically, they put prohibition in with no way of initially enforcing it whatsoever and no. they tried to enforce and it a little bit yeah but they but people more people drank during prohibition that it actually made it more popular but but we lost our whole whiskey supply we did and we <laughs> we, we also lost uh, a lot of styles right so not only prohibition but also industrialization i mean bourbon got down to with industrialization and prohibition eventually you get down to seven big distilleries right and they're all making and i love them i'm not knocking them right but they're all making very similar things that is not what bourbon has always been bourbon used to be a, a huge spec nothing on this table's new this is all stuff that some farm distiller has done at some point in time or very similar to what they have done but it got lost because of prohibition or you take for example entire categories of spirits that are now gone uh, you know, brandy and rye were more popular than bourbon before prohibition, and a lot of people don't know this, but there used to be what was called split brandy, and that's half half grain, half fruit. So you'd have rye and apple, you'd have wheat and peach. Those things can come back still yet. There were entire categories of spirits that got wiped out. Who's your apple brandy? Gone. Nobody came back from that. Um, everybody knows the Lincoln County process, but did you know there's also what's called Robertson County process? So that's Northern Tennessee and Western Kentucky. Uh, basically the same style of whiskey, but you don't sour mash it, you sweet mash it. And it was actually served as a white spirit after being, after being strained through the charcoal. I think what's cool though, if you look at 
distilling history, mm -hmm. it's gonna come back. Oh, it will. It will, because this, this drove every country forever. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. whiskey paid for 100% the Revolutionary War. It paid yeah. for the, the 18, 12, and then it was almost on, pro, the old prohibition almost happened, and then the Civil War happened, and that just put the whole thing at, and it paid for, that was the only tax up until 1916, yeah. and the only reason why prohibition could happen is because they started with income tax. Yes, creature of Jekyll Island. Yep. And, and when you think about it, we were income tax, sales taxed, now we're whiskey taxed and everything. They tax us every which way. And you wonder why they have so much money. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, you're, you're not wrong. That's Maybe for sure. Maybe they're hand sanitizers. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Taxes. Yeah, yeah. That's crazy. Well, you know, these, these small craft distilleries are going to bring back a lot of those styles. I mean, what's on the table here? You know, I'm not going to get 90% of traditional Kentucky bourbon drinkers because they're already so, and that's okay. And those guys make good stuff. But this expands other people's palates. And, and Kentucky bourbon's not going to get less popular. It's going to get more popular. But... There will come a point when people get a little bored with it and they start exploring. Well, I put this out. I think you guys have actually made them redefine and up what they're producing to the public. And I feel that Kentucky, even the, the, the low end benchmarks and whatever, mm -hmm. you taste that now. And the quality of it and what they're putting out is consistently better because of the correct. Because they're so, being pushed. Right, right, yeah. right. And, and that's just, it, in the end, nobody can make enough. Yeah. That there's yeah. obviously, there's there's a shortage always. And that, you know, there's what you want to get and what, and it's being bought up. You can't make yeah. enough. We I agree. Just, Let's just do it to all the categories now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Well, I think your your category. I mean, you're you're getting sucked into it. There's for sure. I mean, yeah. just by the the people expanding their minds and the critics and everybody uh, through this and right. It's yeah. it's awesome. I I'm did. always as surprised as anybody else when uh, when we get a positive review. In in the United <laughs> States, I think the people who are getting screwed are the Scotch makers because yeah. the fact that they're producing barrel strength scotch for the first time consistently now and all of a sudden everybody's doing it it just shows that the bourbon of what bourbon did to overtake scotch in the united states it's not overtaken in the world there's right. no doubt about it you look at what they're producing there they have no problem in other countries oh so, yeah None. but there's no doubt American spirits has redefined themselves. Well, you know, that's that's a category that's up and coming right now. And I think, uh, and I'll, I'll just go ahead and call it, I'll say the year 2025, you're going to really see it. But American single malt is going to be a major, major player in the spirits game by yeah. that point in time. Yeah, I'm especially sure. as Scotch will evolve, start to get part of the market, but then there's going to be a certain amount. I agree. I've seen it. I've, I've tasted some American single malts that are pretty uh, pretty good, but it's just not the hot item right now. I'm looking forward to seeing what uh, what Bill Hockett is doing over at Dayton Barrel Works when he gets those single malts out in the future. That's going to be I'm I'm super excited to see what he's working on. Have Have you guys been talking a lot? Oh, we we talk quite a bit. Right? Yeah, I figured it's just like We're pretty tight. What's really cool is the Gervasi connection between you and him, and then the whole thing, and then now you add Shay in there. And, yeah. and I'm right there. I mean, my house is five minutes from Gervasi. Right. After this big, huge thing I'm doing up until Sunday, me and my wife are going to stay at the villas oh, yeah. and just hang out there. And, nice. Uh, That's awesome. It should be awesome. <laughs> yeah. I just let that out in public. She's just right. mad at me. That was supposed to be Thanks. like on the QT. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> if any of our children are watching, you're in big trouble. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, they're not. <laughs> you know, this is where you say, I still love you, but I need a break. Yeah, I wasn't exactly. supposed to share that to them. <laughs> you said to share it to all the groups. I didn't, I didn't, I had children's group in there. <laughs> Yours. So I've been, I've been on, uh, this, this past week, I've been on the Sopranos kick. I've started rewatching that again. And, uh, I, I feel like every time I watch it, it's a bad thing, right? Every time I watch it, I feel like a little bit of Tony Soprano like rubs off on me. Yeah. I just want to be like, <laughs> and then and, and then they'll be okay. And then the noise of that is even more depressing. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. In in real life and <laughs> yeah, I'm super excited about the new Sopranos movie though. I didn't hear that. Yeah, yeah. it's a prequel, and it's a uh, uh, Gandolfini's son 
plays Tony, young Tony Soprano. Oh, wow. Did you did you get them I to put heard that. to put Spirit of French Lick into the bourbon aspect of the? Mm -hmm. They should. Yeah, they I think should. so. I think that's that's right there. Yeah, I, uh, we, we've tried with Ozarks. That's what I'm aiming for right now is Ozarks. That would be okay. amazing. That's, that's, a, cool, that's a cool that series. I watched it. Well, so, this is the the right way. These are the uh, these are the labels that are fun for me because I get to thumb my nose at the industry a little bit. <laughs> so we've done several of these like Unpretentious, The Right Way, um, Fascination Street. So they're not history based, um, but they are more again thumbing your nose at the industry. So I love <laughs> I love the guys at Peerless. I love John Waddell in particular. Uh, they did a rye whiskey finished in an absinthe barrel from Copper and Kings. And of course, that was an absinthe I worked on, and I thought, well, now I'm just competing with myself. I've got to, I got to put something down, <laughs> you know? and I got to thumb my nose out a little bit because, I mean, you know, we're we're uh, we're in a lightweight division, so if they if they punch at us, it just looks bad on them. But <laughs> yeah. you know, so we decided that we would do the same thing. I had um, the absinthe barrel left over from the Fascination Street Barrel Age Absinthe Project, and I had some three-year-old rye whiskey, and I thought, well, let's throw that rye whiskey in there and see, you know, eight nine months later, see what it does. And uh, I think what you're gonna get here, you're gonna notice like, and again, I love the peerless thing, mm -hmm. but the peerless thing is very absinthe driven. This mm -hmm. has that star anise characteristic, but I feel like that rye whiskey really fights back with that absinthe in a very positive way. Uh, and wow. it's it's called the right way, A, because of the thumb and the nose thing, but B, um, especially with the label, I'm a huge David Lynch fan, and uh, I wanted to do some kind of like movie label or movie poster sort of design. So very much like the Lost Highway. And like, if you read the back of it, it's like reading a, a movie descriptor. Okay. Um, and we make fun of ourselves too. So in the, un <laughs> in the unexpected sequel to Unpretentious, like that's a thing. Right. right. <laughs> we bring you the spectacle of innovation meets necessity on the wrong side of the river. Three-year-old straight rye whiskey meets the mysticism of absinthe on a hero's journey. And it even has a whole like distilled and bottled by Spirits of Lake soundtrack available. As <laughs> <laughs> it's on record. Do you? There's probably one on YouTube. There should be at least a playlist. There's a playlist. Just a playlist. Right? There's, there is a playlist. There right. is a playlist. But now the, un, the, unpret the unpretentious, uh, how fast did that marketing campaign that you came up with, how fast did that sell that out? <laughs> that bullshit I put on Facebook. No, that was works. awesome the whole time. Yeah, it obviously yeah. did. It, it was, was fast. fast. Oh, right. It was very fast. <laughs> He's like, yeah. two months, yeah. He was like, this is selling for $2,000 on the, the black, you know, on the secondary market. And all of a sudden, I'm just like, wait. I hit Jeff up because I'm, I'm the one that... I'm the bourbon hunter. I'm the one yeah. that's searching and going all over the states, and I'm all over the secondary markets and all that. And all that. Did you see that shit? Yeah. <laughs> it's all I secondary. Said, we're like, you gotta get on the dark I'm web. Like, I'm like, it's Alan. No way. <laughs> we had people. That, I'll put it this way: we had people that should have known that didn't know, and they would message me and be like, "Are you guys really selling that for forty forty dollars a pour?" And I'm like. <laughs> No, no. But if you want to pay that, I'll take the extra. It's fine. <laughs> I, I mean, told the brother, the at the, 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 the when you sold it, it was forty dollars a bottle. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, $40 it's like it's forty dollars a bottle. You can make uh, eighteen hundred, you know, eighteen hundred seventy dollars. It's just like how many people bought it? Yeah, they were like, yeah, and then they're like, what? It doesn't sell. Yep. It was, no, it was amazing. Jolie just kept oh, like, telling cool. you to shut up. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> every post, right. she's like, what are you doing? Yeah, yeah. There's so many, so many phone calls like that like get the phone call the first thing in the morning what the fuck is wrong with you <laughs> <laughs> why are you doing this because it works just watch ride the gazelle ride the gazelle that's it ride the gazelle <laughs> so bourbon and absinthe had a baby and what was born was the right way there you go. Right. Yeah. No, you go. no, they had a baby that's going to go to college and become a nuclear scientist. Yeah. <laughs> this is the right way. We took it to this the next is, level. Uh, yeah. Let me let me be clear for for consumers. This is the um, the Elon Musk of rye whiskey. Yes, yes. <laughs> there, there, yeah. there you go. <laughs> the Dogecoin. The Dogecoin. Yeah. The Dogecoin. You can really smell the licorice and the absinthe on the nose and you get a little bit in the taste, but then there's bourbon in there. And so yeah, I guess- the rye that, kicks I in. And the rye kicks in and, and you get that little heat numbers. and a little spice. Your other absinthe, it's very what unique. Was, what's on the uh, that I have? The Fascination Street. Yeah, Fascination yeah. Street. That's more absinthe. absinthe yeah. yep. Mm -hmm. yep. This is more bourbon, bourbon with the, like you said, a baby. So, they were, so they were fraternal twins, not identical twins. 
Word. No, the other one was... <laughs> I drank a lot of that. The other one was um, Alan married a supermodel and the baby looked like a supermodel and that was the absent part. <laughs> married her before she was a supermodel. Yeah, exactly. She became right. a supermodel later. Yes. Once she realized she could do better. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then now she pretends like she doesn't know me. <laughs> this is amazing that I can smell this like on one side I'm getting the, the black lic licorice, but on the other side at the same time I'm getting all that rye whiskey yep. mm -hmm. at the same time. That was the just, goal was to hold that rye whiskey up alongside and it. And it does. Yeah. But, it but not the awesome. part of rye that I hate. That right. It's there. It's got that bite, but there's no, it's all, it's absinthe instead of celery and dill pickle. And <laughs> old man's piss. Like I said, old man's <laughs> urine. Yeah, there's right in that in there. Yeah. Thankfully, there's no urine there. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> that you know. <laughs> and, and if there was, if, if, the if that the would sauce, be your yeah. dad. <laughs> <laughs> and you would have distilled that out. Don't so give him any ideas. ideas. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> what an idea, right? You'd have yep. to do it without him knowing. The Odell Bishop <laughs> commemorative bottle. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. I can't wait to definitely I cannot get, wait get to this picture on the front. <laughs> Poor Dale, he gets blamed for so much. He does. Oh my he God. does. As, as it should. As it should be. <laughs> so like when you hired him, he knew what he was in for, right? Oh, he knew exactly. Yeah. What was. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. He fucking this made is, you. <laughs> yeah. This is, this is payback for my childhood. Is what this is. Oh. So this God. Is, you know, a lot of. Uh, why don't you go play in the street somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> all yeah. that, all that stuff we were told was good. And now you get the chance. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's a great story. You and your dad. That's, mm -hmm. I, that's just. I, I worked with my dad from high school all the way until forty years old. Right. And then I went and became. Uh, at this point, they moved to California. The whole the whole art in business was changing. So I took the job in Ohio to be a plant manager. With I would I managed people, so that part was easy. But then over the last 17 years, learned everything like you do here. You know everything. So if someone new comes in, you can teach them that and teach them the way that you want them to do it. Yeah. But at the same time, then you know, like if you hire someone at 30, they should be a better worker, or someone at. 18 you give them a little bit of leeway because they're working with in a whiskey plant and some days they're not going to be here because <laughs> they haven't figured yeah. it out yet right right well he, he worked at Kimball's for shit like almost 40 years and uh my grandfather worked at Kimball's for like 35 years and I wanted to get him out of there and was lucky enough to get him in here um, and ironically, he's still technically at Kimball's because this is an old Kimball's piano plant. So oh, wow. he's still uh, he's still stuck in the Kimball's curse. So. <laughs> yeah, but doesn't let go. No, <laughs> no. no. <laughs> I uh, worked for my dad because I took over the fire extinguisher business. He was a career military man, twenty three years active duty over wow. four branches, uh, and. Uh, he started this and said fire extinguisher service in 79 and I was the only one out of three sons that worked for him that could put up with all his military bullshit, <laughs> deal with it. his <laughs> right. rules and everything right. and get him to stick with it. <laughs> so well, that's how a, I got it. You're in a unique situation. But he you? came back to work for me for the that's last few no, years. Oh, he did work for oh, you. Yeah, but but yeah. he's working for you. <laughs> so he had to put up with all your bullshit as a kid, and now, yeah. or is he forcing you to put up with his bullshit, even though you're working? So in other words, you're working for him now. Still. I'm not working for him, but it's about <laughs> fucking half and half with, with, with it. Sometimes, like you can't just tell him you need something done because you're like, oh, I have to go do this. Oh, I didn't ask you to go do that. I asked you to fucking take care of what I just asked you. To do. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I will tell you, I've had to threaten to leave him at work a few times or not give him a ride to work in the morning. <laughs> and then I let him drive to work one morning and uh, and uh, he made the mistake of saying that he thought that Nickelback was a good band. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I stopped my car in the middle of Highway 56. I was like, get out of my car now. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you ever fucking That's, say that again. Those are five <laughs> words. Yeah. yeah. Boy, I like photograph. I bet you do. Get out of my fucking car right now. Hey, it's a generation <laughs> thing. Right. Right. Nickelback, Def Leppard without talent. 
And they have the advantage because their drummer has two yeah, arms. Two arms. Yeah, I was exactly. just going to say that. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, no, no, that? no. no. They, they had an album or two albums with two arms. It was just the third album that they actually made well, it actually when they made eliminated it. Yeah. Who knew so that's the, all it took for success? Yeah. <laughs> you just had a cut off. You had an auto accident, cut its arm off, and right. put them on a turntable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they could see he's only got one. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Do you hear that? That's hot the sound tub. of hate mail coming it's, coming it's, to the it's inbox. Like, right? Oh my god! It's like the, the hot tub time machine when he keeps gonna lose his arm. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Same yeah. thing. They'll gotcha. go back in time, and it's uh, like they they put, they make it so he doesn't lose his arm, and then they're not famous. I, I will be honest with you. Um, I think Canada are great neighbor, neighbors. Canadians are great neighbors, but they they do owe us an apology. For Nickelback, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. they really do. Not Brian Adams. Brian Adams. Was no, Brian good. Adams. Good. And Rush. Rush makes up yeah. for Nickelback, but at least a. Eh, we're sorry. Okay. Well, I <laughs> think I think Nickelback Facebook likes going up. <laughs> you hear all the comments I think, coming in. I think Nickelback <laughs> did the did the right thing and committed suicide right afterwards. <laughs> Musical suicide because they never had any. They, every single song went on that album went. What an off the charts, and then <laughs> yeah. just nothing. Right. Yeah. Like, well, did Nickelback even exist? You know, I mean, ACDC made a career off of off of four chords, but they did it the right way. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know, they fucking partied every single. <laughs> and, 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 and the Ramones did it off of one chord, off one chord, which yeah. is yeah. Insane. played badly. Played badly. I, I, I saw them at, at live, and and they basically, I could not hear any song recognizable and they just pasted us back on the back wall it was just like it was just like one two three four <laughs> it's like you couldn't even get the the you know the the court like whatever the <laughs> i hate this part about it you know the what is it called when they, they sing it over and over again? The chorus. The chorus. Yeah, the chorus. Yeah. I was going to say chords, but the chorus. You couldn't even tell what the chorus what was. was happening. That right. was like that was a, a classic concert. Then I saw them a couple of years later at an outdoor venue, and I could actually hear. But that must that must have been just one psycho night for them. Is that I, the is I, that the concert you had to save me from the mosh pit? The, yeah, oh, that's yes, the outdoor, the outdoor, the outdoor one. Yeah, which I, the I'm getting killed in the mosh pit, which is and Jeff had to like dive in to save me. People were leaving with like black <laughs> eyes, broken glasses. He's like, oh my god! Because we just got a little too close. We were walking, and all of a sudden, we were in the mosh, mosh pit. pit. Yeah, yeah, yeah it happened. I will tell you the other thing I figured out about my dad since he started working here is that he's a morning person, which I fucking hate. Uh, let me tell you what. For about the first three months that we rode together to work, every morning he said more to me and one hour of driving, and I'm pretty sure he ever said to me in my entire life. That's because you were awake. Always sleeping. And listen, that's it's supposed to be like, that's my drive time. I listen to my podcast, I do my thing, right? And like, I'm not trying to be mean, but like, Sorry. now you're just getting on my nerves. <laughs> so like, there was one morning where he was just, it, it was, it's always like some kind of like small talk, like it's not like real conversation. And like 20 minutes into it, I'm like, I turn the radio down. I'm like, do you ever shut up? Do you ever, <laughs> you ever just like, when did, when did the, you didn't talk to me at all when I was a kid. What is happening right now <laughs> that you won't shut up? It's like, fun, I won't talk anymore. Now? That's because you didn't, you didn't, you didn't wake up till 11 a.m. Right. So by that time, he was all talked out because your mom had to deal with that. Uh, <laughs> my, my wife is a nighttime person and I'm a, I'm a morning person by you know, from a naturally a morning person, but because I had kids and four of them, I became a morning and a night. I forced myself to be a nighttime person. So it, we're we're up at night and she's whatever. And you fall asleep while I'm talking to you. <laughs> but, but, this is, but she's complaining that I have to get up at 5.30 and it's one o'clock. Right? Like, and then it's like, one o'clock in the morning and she's like- Are you oh. listening to me? What's the last thing you heard? Yeah, like, What's the last oh, thing you heard? You know, but then I'm up at 5.30 and I'm a morning person. There's no doubt about it, even then. And I'm so I just sacrificed sleep for family. There was there, just, there, at one yeah. point it was like, am I gonna be a dad? Or am I gonna just not sleep? And I just went with not sleep. Not sleep. But yeah. now it's hard to sleep more than six, five, six hours. Oh, you know, yeah. it, 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 I, this morning, I think I was up at uh, five o'clock 
and the alarm's gonna go off at 5.30, and I knew, but I was just at five o'clock on my phone or whatever. So I'm, I'm a morning, and she hates it because she's not a morning person. So annoying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but like you said, it's like when, when she's up in the morning, she has to get up early, she's like, would you just shut the fuck up? Why <laughs> <laughs> are you so happy? This morning I said, please give me another half of an hour. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, I thought you were gonna sleep late this morning. You did everything last That's night. That's because he was on yeah. his phone and I, yeah, I was I was a morning <laughs> person. No, he yeah. opened the door and let all the light in, you know, he was still sleeping. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> All right, so I think we we did this. I think we did this podcast. Uh, we made right. this podcast righteous. Yeah. Righteous. Yeah. Right. Oh yeah, brother. Appreciate so uh, anything you want to add? I mean, yeah, another glass of this. <laughs> I'm for that too. Yeah, I would so have to say we'll that. You're gonna get the. We'll sure, we'll have not? we'll do this we'll while we're. Like oh, I wanted to say. <laughs> you noticed that uh, we use um, the Alabama song by Jim Morrison. Yeah. But we don't let it go all the way, right? Because that song definitely is not a 2021 song. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not a PC. Yeah. Mm. I thought you were gonna say the YouTube gods would shut you down. Uh, they should. Yeah. I mean, it was it was uh, it was the Doors, and it is Jim Morrison, and that is a remake. Uh, but you know, looking for uh, oh. Who, who? You? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh. No. <laughs> <laughs> You're cut off. Man. None for Superman. I don't Superman. think you mentioned earlier, but the uh, second batch of Lee Sinclair took double gold at um, oh, yeah. the Denver about uh, that. Spirits competition. Excellent. Oh. 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 Yeah. Yeah. As it should. Congratulations to that. Yeah. 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 And yeah. Maddie got silver. Yes, silver. Yeah. 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 yeah, and somebody was you saying that. You're doing the second batch of Maddie? Oh, yeah. Yeah, those coming too. The Lee and the Maddie, the Solomon, the William Dalton. And the Morning Glory Wall 5B mainline. Mm -hmm. awesome. Well, and there's going to be another bottling of both the Lee and the Maddie later this fall. Um, as I, well. I, that, honestly, they're going to, both Veach and Minnick are going to like the evolution, there's no doubt. Hope and, so. And then you won't have any, so we're just. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you will. You just have to have Doge going to buy it. I do. Yes. I got right. some. Yes, there you by go. By then, the doors will no longer be BPC, and I'll just trade you bottles for doors LPs. So. Yes. <laughs> I have. I actually have doors LPs. I've got a couple. Oh, man. But, but now, the amazing last thing I'll say is the amazing thing is Apple Music, $9.99 a month. Right. And you have Ooh. every single fucking song on the planet. Yep. It never mm -hmm. existed. Nice. <clears throat> I mean, every single new song that gets released, my, my son's like, hey, did you ever hear this? I'm like, no. And I just go to it and I can hear it. It's just, there it is. it's unbelievable how we went through music, mm -hmm. how you had to do it, and what's available now for 10 bucks a month. Uh, we, you easily bought, you know, $40, $50 a month on albums or CDs oh, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. And now for 10 bucks a month, you get everything. everything. And it's just like, people don't understand, like, especially the millennials, they have no clue how unbelievable that is. Yeah, right. to have access to all that stuff. And then it expands your, you know, you can listen to anybody, anytime, anywhere. You're just like, hey, Siri, and boom. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, that's amazing. Yeah, if I could, let me see the bottle and bond bottle just for a second. For the leak. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's it. It's in his, it's, it's going in his bag. Just <laughs> no, uh, <hey> oh. <laughs> I just want to announce that too. I want everybody to be aware that uh, look for an upcoming giveaway on the Scot Scotchy Bourbon Boys for a bottle of the Lee W. Sinclair God, Four so Grain cool. Bourbon. All right. All right. <laughs> upcoming soon wonderful all right so let's get out let's have uh, morrison take us out all right thank you alan oh thank you man thanks alan thank yeah, you Lauralyn. Laura Lynn. yes yeah. thank you we appreciate it i have pee so bad <laughs> i'll be back right. it's like a three cups of coffee this morning oh, yeah. remember everybody good bourbon equals good friends
All right. Nice. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you guys. All right. Yeah.